Amen, I say to you, I do not know you, therefore stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Today's parable of our Lord is again one of those parables that is often misunderstood. It is often reduced to a simple mathematical formula that half the world is saved and half the world is lost because of the five prudent virgins and the five foolish virgins but rather this is an extraordinary catechism given by our Lord on the nature of the church and particularly of that part of the church of which we are members, that is, the church militant. For it is a brilliant and rich reflection because it is the divine reflection, that is, the divine word. It is Christ himself explaining to us what we truly are called to believe in the ninth article of the creed. For often it is a good habit periodically when we recite the creed to repeat those first words, I believe, that are again we are asked to repeat when we begin to, profound, profound, to profess our faith in belief of the Holy Spirit but it is intended that each article be preceded at least by an act of our will with that moniker, I believe. And so it is all these truths that we believe. And so in the ninth article of the, tree, the creed, we state, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And in order to understand that, we must understand that essentially the church has two divisions, that is, the church triumphant, for strictly speaking, it is not true that the church has three forms, the church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant, because the church suffering is united to the church triumphant. For being souls who are suffering in purgatory, it is not possible for them to lose their soul, and so ultimately they are members of that church which, which worships God for all eternity. And so it is essentially when we speak of the church triumphant, we are speaking of that assemblage of the blessed spirits, that is, the good angels, together with the souls who have triumphed over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And there is also that second part, the church militant, which is particularly what our Lord is referring to in today's a parable. And so to understand the parable, we must begin to understand what in what consists the church militant. It is, as the Roman Catechism defines it, it is the society of the faithful still dwelling on earth. It is called militant because it wages constant warfare with its implacable enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so we must clearly understand that as members of the church militant, we are involved in a constant warfare. Indeed, the first vicar of Christ would warn every member of the mystical body of this truth in his contribution to the Bible, in which he tells us that we are to be very weary for, the, for our opponent, the devil, roams about seeking those that he can destroy. And so, in one sense, we are never to take rest, even when we must succumb to that that which the body requires, that natural sleep. It has been the constant habit within the tradition of the church for the faithful to consecrate every beat of their heart as, a, as an oblation, a, a prayer to the Lord so that we, even while sleeping, are offering worship to God by the very beat of our hearts so that we are constantly reminded of that, that warfare of which we are involved, that warfare in which our Lord was completely victorious. And so, in order to understand the nature of the church militant, we must understand she is constructed essentially of two kinds of persons, that is, the good, referred to in today's gospel by our Lord as the wise and prudent virgins, and the bad, that is, the foolish virgins. But our Lord in no way indicates that half the church is bad, half the church is good. Indeed, there can be times in history when all of the church is good and all of the church is bad. But ultimately, we know it is a mixture. It is a mixture of the good and the bad. And as the church points out, it is better even to be a bad member of the Holy Church than to be in that unsafe place that is outside her bosom. And so, 
We must also make a further distinction, for our Lord in today's gospel is explicitly referring to those members of the mystical body, that is, those who have been claimed by him in baptism, and either by living good lives or bad lives, still in a very real sense, remain within the church militant. But there is another class of persons that is not contained in the church militant, and it is essential for all Catholics to understand this and to understand it in its proper context. Because when we mention these words, it is also mentioned in reference to that absolute and total condemnation and they have no hope for salvation. It is not what the church means when it uses the word infidels to, to describe those who have never belonged to the church, not having, that not having knowledge of her. An infidel can be saved insofar as they observe the natural law in its fullness and integrity, and through no fault of their own remain ignorant of Christ. At any point in their lives when that ignorance they are, they are responsible for that, then they are in a most dangerous position. And even then, it is not permissible for any member of the mystical body, the good or the bad, to declare them lost for all eternity. It is their responsibility to offer prayer and sacrifice for their conversion so that ultimately they can acquire absolute forgiveness of their sins through the sacrament in, in their case, it would be the sacrament of baptism. And then there are those known as heretics in schismatics because they have separated from the church and belong to her only as deserters belong to an army from which they have deserted. This becomes very crucial in our day, in our age, if we are to understand what ecumenism is and how the church goes about. That is, if we are to understand the pastoral mission of the church. For at the time heretics and schismatic separate themselves, we will notice that the father, the vicar, is much more stern than he appears to be in our times. And yet, how constantly do we hear the Pope criticize for his pastoral care for the separated brethren? And yet, we know even in the natural order that in the first rebellion of a child, a father is much more stern because he has immediate hope of their return. If they do not return with that stern correction, then they go off like the prodigal son and begin to destroy their very substance. It is not at that point that any member of the mystical body is to seek them out with the rod and the rule of that stern discipline in which a child is still very closely united to his home. They must be sought out with that pastoral care known as charity, kindly attempting to bring them back in. And if we understand this, then we understand, contrary to what all error says of the Second Vatican Council, it is not the cause of the problem in the church. The cause of the problem of the church is the improper understanding by either one extreme or the other as to the nature of the Second Vatican Council. It is to the vicar of Christ to determine how the church carries out her pastoral works. And it is for the vicar of Christ to determine how souls are to be brought into her, how the infidels are to be converted, and how the heretics and the schismatics are to be brought back. We live nearly 500 centuries, five centuries from the Protestant Revolution. Most of our separating brethren are separated through no fault of their own. It is the culture and the life that they were brought into. And so we must strive to show them that while they believe in Christ, their belief is defective. That is, they have not the fullness of the faith. And we are to try to show them where that fullness resides. Now, with that knowledge, does anyone dare accuse the vicar of Christ of not proceeding in a prudent manner in these matters? Who would dare to do so? Someone who themselves have become bad Catholics because they are constantly challenging their father as to how Christ intended him to proceed. And so 
we must truly understand that. And then we can begin to understand how that third category of people is perhaps the category that should be the primary object of our charity and our prayers and our works of mercy. That is the excommunicated. That is those who by the sentence of the church are no longer numbered among her children. They remain outside the communion of the church until restored by repentance. That is, by a juridical act of the church, they have been separated. And that separation cannot be removed unless it is removed by the vicar of Christ or those whom he has delegated to do so, as in the case of those who have committed the crime of abortion, in which he has given every priest permission to absolve what formerly was reserved only to the Holy See. And why so? Because the vicar of Christ is called to bring the mercy of God to souls. And so, when a sin is present in society, that indicates the absolute debauchery in which the world is engrossed, the vicar of Christ, who formerly had to deal with it occasionally, now has to deal with it every single day of the life of the mystical body. And so he gives all priests the authority to absolve that which is most heinous because he is called to love and to bring souls to Christ. And it is to him and him alone that we are to understand every council within the church, whether it be the First Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, or those at Ephesus and Trent and throughout the church. And when we understand this, we see very clearly the difference between the Council of Trent is that that separation was still new. And so the father was firmer, sterner. The Second Vatican Council repeats the same doctrines, the same principles, but simply tempered because now the children have been raised through generation and generation of error and through no fault of their own are separated from Christ in that sense. They are the offspring of the original deserters and hence less responsible. And so we see very clearly that when the Pope through our lifetimes has proceeded in such a manner, he truly shows himself to be one of the wise and prudent virgins because he knows his mission is not to destroy souls, his mission is to save them. And so we must truly understand that because if we do, then we will, become, we will begin to understand what is necessary to understand for every member of the mystical body. For even if the lives of the priests and the bishops within the church are debased, in, are debased by unworthiness, they still belong to the church and nothing is taken away from their powers. That is, when they absolve us of our sins, we are absolved. When they baptize, we are baptized. When they offer the Mass, the Mass is offered, despite their personal responsibility for their own sins, because the church is not based on the cult of the bishops or the priest or any member's personality. We are not involved in the cult of personality. Indeed, it has been declared to be contrary to faith to talk about the quote-unquote personality of Christ because once you postulate personality to our Lord in that sense you make him subject to every psychologist and psychologist who wishes to analyze God that is the point of of one of the books of of one of the Protestants when God in the dark what does he mean by God in the dark it is not something that we find down on the ocean the dock is the English term for that which you sit in when you are undergoing a trial. You are the accused, and you sit in the dock, and everyone throws your accusations against you. And accusations are being thrown against our Lord left and right, both inside the church and outside the church, questioning his vicar, questioning the way of the church to proceed, questioning whether the liturgy is proper or not. It is to the vicar of Christ to determine those things. It is impossible for the vicar of Christ to permit the holy sacrifice of the Mass not to be the holy sacrifice of the Mass in whichever form he, it, it, he allows. It is still the Mass. 
and throughout the history of the church, there has been always reformation of the liturgy. But it is only true and good if that reformation is headed by the vicar of Christ. And so we must come to understand that so that we truly come to understand the reality and the nature of the church, both triumphant and militant, is that she is a supernatural society that is headed by God and not any man, no man. She is not the cult of personality, which was the cause of many of the heretical separations and schismatic separations within the mystical body of Christ and the perseverance of infidels in their era. If it weren't for charismatic personalities like Mahatma Gandhi and Buddha and whatnot, those errors would not perdure. But they are ultimately reduced to the cult of personality. And whatever may be the merits or demerits of the personal lives of those who are the philosophers and the forerunners and the leaders of false religions, they nonetheless remain false religions. And they are not means of salvation. But it is not to us to determine how the church militant is to go forth into those places and those lands in which the error perdures. It is to the vicar of Christ to determine that. And he does so knowing that he and he alone will answer to the Lord for his actions. There is no man in the world who has more responsibility and more weight on his shoulder than the vicar of Christ. And may God forgive every member of the mystical body who is constantly calling into question that man rather than on their knees, begging God to protect him and to guide him through that most severe of responsibilities. What man in his right mind would ever desire to be the vicar of Christ that is insanity at its height. And the greatest pope of our times, Pius X, in tears, begged off of that dignity until Cardinal Mary Duval simply pointed out to him, it was God's will and you must take it. He didn't beg off because he didn't recognize the dignity of the office. He begged off precisely because he recognized the extraordinary dignity of that man known as the successor of Peter and felt himself in true humility to be unworthy of that cause. Contrary to that false humility in which we always see people declaring, I don't want this honor, I don't want this, this, this honor or this, this office. And then ultimately they wind up taking it because their intention all the while was to acquire it, not for the good of souls, but for themselves. Every office within the church is for others, including being godparents. The catechism of the Catholic Church states that a godparent has an office within the mystical body of Christ. That office is to be exercised for the good of the souls in which you are a godparent. And so, every office in the church is to be exercised for the good of others and it meets its culmination in the office of the Vicar of Christ. And so, we must understand so that we truly understand what it means to be a good member of the church or a bad member of the church. For the good member has has faith along with works of mercy, charity, and all the other virtues. The bad members have their lamps, are dying out, because as St. James tells us, faith without works is dead. That's why Martin Luther declared St. James' epistle to be epistle, an epistle of straw. In other words, it should all be, they should all be gathered up and burned because he pointed out very clearly, you may hold the faith of Christ, but unless you have the works of Christ, your faith, as St. Paul declares, is nothing but a clanging symbol, a show, an outward show, that does nothing for the world and does nothing for Christ. And so, it is incumbent upon every member of the mystical body to understand that. Most of us struggle simply with periods of being good Catholics 
and being bad Catholics because we are weak, for ultimately, only Christ knows who the good Catholics and the bad Catholics are. But you cannot, as it were, acquire true Catholicism by a formulaic faith. If I do such and such, God has to give me such and such. So if I pray, say, a thousand rosaries a day, God has to give me a thousand graces. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't have to give us anything. He has to give us nothing. It is his mercy that gives us everything because in his mercy, through the sacramental life of the church militant, he gives us true life because he gives us life in himself so that we can constantly, as St. Paul says, strive for the dying of that old man, Adam, ourselves. So because we have put on in the baptismal garment the new man, Christ, and the new man must show the works of Christ, which is ultimately what? Sacrifice for the sake of others. And so we must strive to understand that. For there is profound symbolism in our Lord's description of the church militant. The lamp is a faithful mind or faith itself. The oil is good works. The fuel that does what? Burns the flame or gives off the light, which is charity. And then we begin to understand why the church is described by Isaiah as a light burning on a mountain top. It is the charity of the members of the mystical body that draws all nations to her. And in drawing all nations to her, we draw all nations to Christ because he is the only eternal light. Contrary to the notion that one of our political leaders whose light burns at his grave is an eternal light. That light one day will go out and he, like all who have passed before us, will be judged by God. And we will be judged according to whether we have put on the clothing of Christ, his works, his charity, and scripture tells us that his works and his charity were right down to the finest minutia what we would consider insignificant. One of the classic examples in Scripture of the depth of how Christ penetrated into human life is that he was found constantly playing with children and the apostles, before they got the point, were constantly trying to take him away from the children. The Lord entered into humanity like no one else has or will enter into humanity, and he even touched the children, not by anything profound by worldly standards. You know, in our day and age, we would say, because he went out and literally played the games of children with children so that even the children would know that God was with them and he came to be with them always in their human life so that they may be with him always in the life to come. And so the light that is fueled by the good works of Christ is the virtue of charity. The vessel in which all this is contained is our conscience that accuses us of either doing good works, that is, works of Christ, or bad works. And so we must constantly examine our conscience and repent of all those faults and failings, but repent in a sane and a sound way. The Lord knows we are weak. And the Lord knows we have all kinds of foibles, all kinds of failings. And even if our fall was great, St. Maximilian Mary would point out, don't wring your hands. Dust yourself off, get to confession, put your hands back on the plow and go forward. The Lord is not cruel. And that is essential for us to understand, to understand why schismatics and heretics become cruel. Because they set themselves up ultimately as Christ. Now, if you're not God, and you try to deal with human weakness, what as a human being is ultimately going to be your response? Cruelty. I'll make them do it. 
I'll make them do it with a sword, a whip, or whatever. I will simply make them do what I determine is right. That is not how it works. Christ determines what is right and has revealed to that, that to us in creedal formula. And it is our responsibility to flesh out that creed by constantly studying and praying and asking Our Lady to give us the grace to live the life of Christ. And the cause of both the good and the bad within the church, this parable will point out, is the same. What causes the good to be good and the bad to be bad is the same. The delay of the bridegroom. The delay of the bridegroom. It causes both the good and the bad because each one react to the delay in a unique way. So we must understand what is the nature of this delay. If we are bad, we conclude God is cruel. But the bridegroom delays according to good sound Catholic teaching, not because he is cruel, but he does so in order to give us time to repent and acquire good works. This is why he delays the time of judgment. Now in our culture, we have all kinds of icons that point out to us the contrary understanding. We think they're just secular. Take something like the Star Trek series, just secular, right? No, Gene Roddenberry, the creator, said in an interview in a humanist magazine that the purpose of Star Trek was to annihilate the belief of God in the hearts and souls of others. And he particularly said to destroy the notion of a blood sacrifice. That was the express intent of Star Trek according to the mind of the creator of Star Trek, to destroy the notion of a blood sacrifice. How can we see this? There is one classic example of it in which there is this little fella named Trevelyan who is God toying with humanity like a puppeteer. And when Trevelyan gets bored or when his mother finds him, you hear a woman's voice in the background, Trevelyan, I told you not to do that. Come home. Stop playing with them. It is not just bad, it is blasphemous because it attacks our Lord and our Lady and paints them as absolute cruel. Cruelty to the height. They just toy with humanity. But that is not the reality. The reality is what the scripture shows us. Our Lady doesn't toy with humanity at the Annunciation. She at that point is praying for it. And what does she receive? Not a puppeteer, not a puller of the strings who simply severs him when he's done with you, but she receives the very Son of God in order to bring himself to us, to communicate with us as a human being. That's how much God loves us. He is not the great puppeteer in the sky. He has tabernacled, that is, pitched his tent, his humanity, with us in order to get right down in the mud with us and lift us out of it. That is why. And that is why any movement, liberal or conservative, progressive or traditional, is cruelty because it does not take you out of the muck, it pulls you down into it in its own unique way, but ultimately it pulls you to the same place, the Antichrist. No matter how appealing it may seem. And in this we must understand one thing. Christ could have ended all things with his resurrection. All things with his resurrection. Because in his mother, he has complete and total victory. This warfare we're involved in isn't determined by numbers. It's determined by who won. Either Satan won or God won. And the, you don't determine who won by how many souls are in hell or how many souls are in heaven. You determine whether God won by the Immaculate Conception. Because in her, God is completely and totally victorious. And if he had chose to end it on his resurrection, 
he would have ended completely victorious and still the same loving and just God. But as the saints explain to us in a mystery beyond our comprehension in this life, the mother of God was not content to simply be the mother of God. She desired to be the mother of all souls, and so she begged that God would give us life in her son. That is why we have baptism, and that is why we can say the mother of God truly is the cause of baptism because she asked for it as with all the other six sacraments and the mystical body of Christ. She truly and really asked for it. And no good son can refuse such a good mother. So there is a mystery in Our Lady that we can't comprehend, but we must strive because we must understand she is God's victory. And his delay is the result of her intercession. No, Father... I want them all. And so, I want your son to do everything to gain all of them for me. And we will not penetrate that mystery until we have safely found our way through this life into eternal life. And so, to this point, we have spoken about faith. That is the supernatural virtue which God infuses into our souls and by which, relying on the authority of God himself, we believe everything which he has revealed and which to his church he, he, he proposes for belief and charity. The supernatural virtue which, again, God infuses. God is the initiator, not us. God infuses into, into our souls and by which we love God above all for his own sake and our neighbor for ourselves for God's sake. And that leaves one. And this is crucial in our society because hope is the virtue which determines how you slumber. Slumber is a reference to the death of all men. And hope is the virtue by which we respond to our impending death. And so, it is that supernatural virtue which again God infuses into the soul and by which we desire and expect that eternal life that God has promised to his servants as well as the means necessary to attain it. The good simply believe that and live according to it. The bad don't. It's very simple. The bad don't. And so, in their impending death, they seek that which gives them good religious feelings in this life. And so, ultimately, whether they take the liberal side or the traditional side, they simply are going to manifest in each one of them their predominant vice. And may God help us if we, be, we are being led by those who exercise the seven capital vices. It is simply unadulterated raw cruelty. And let us understand from St. David. The Lord gave him three choices because he needed to be punished for what he did. And he simply said, I'll take the one that you oversee, God, and the one he begged off was being delivered into the hands of his enemies. Why? Because he knew if God does the chastising, it's always tempered by his mercy. If it is man, it has no tempering. It has no limit until it burns itself out in the final throes of its rage. We have been living in a culture, in a society that has been fueled by enthusiasm for centuries. And the problem with enthusiasm is it doesn't get better as it burns out. It gets worse. And it gets worse in every aspect, in every crook and nanny of human life until it finally burns itself up and only God knows the carnage that will be involved. The Nazis of Germany, the communists of Russia, the communists in America, all of them only pale in comparison to what all those errors will bring about on humanity if we don't understand God is con in control of the church militant. He has assigned the vicar of Christ to oversee the pastoral activity of the church, and it is to no good Catholic to call into question the works of the vicar of Christ. 
as the vicar of Christ. He may in his personal life hold all kinds of errors. So what? We have a promise from our Lord, and St. Alphonsus de Liguori says very categorically, if it ever was in the mind of a vicar of Christ to publicly promulgate error, heresy, it would never come out of his mouth because the Lord would simply remove him from this life. And we must go forward with that faith because there are too many errors. And as it has been said time and time again, the contrary reaction to liberalism, which has had the four, is fascism. More attractive because it appears to be orderly, but precisely because of that, that more destructive. Its carnage is unlimited, and it becomes very attractive wherever it is seen and however it is seen. Okay? And ultimately, it is not determined by what they say, it is determined by what they do. Actions speak louder than words. And in the mystical body of Christ, they are either the actions of Christ or they are the actions of Satan. No matter how attractive they may appear, no one will doubt the beauty of the liturgy in its what's called traditional form or in the Novus Ordo form. But the liberal can use the Novus Ordo as a club just as the traditionalist can use the traditional mass as a club. The liturgy is the sacrifice of Christ and it is not to any member of the mystical body to be used in a fashion to browbeat. It is the blood sacrifice of Christ represented in an unbloody manner. Either one is to be to participated in with great reverence and devotion because it is Christ's sacrifice for us and we are called to unite ourselves to it. And it is the salvation of the world, but not in a scientific approach to it, tweaking this and tweaking that. It is the salvation of the world because it is the means by which God has demonstrated his love and mercy for humanity. It is the means by which God has established beyond a shadow of a doubt that he dwelt with mankind and made the ultimate sacrifice for mankind. And that is the Catholic understanding of the liturgy. And no one has the right within the mystical body of Christ to use it as a club. No one. And that is what our Lord is speaking of to us in today's gospel in giving us this most profound and in-depth reflection on the church militant. And so, let us be reminded by one of those holy vicars from the past, St. Leo the Great. Christian, always be aware of the dignity you have acquired in being members of the mystical body of Christ and called to fight for the church militant so that you may rejoice with the church triumphant.